Well, 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 welcome to Discovery. How many of you guys excited to be here tonight? Good. Hey, that makes what we're about to say easier, right? It makes it easier. If you guys are happy to be here, then we're happy to be here. Amen. If you guys didn't figure it out, I am not Pastor Jason. You know, we get mixed up all the time. Twinsies. I get it. I get it. Uh, we look just the same, you know. But uh, I'm Pastor Sean. I am the missions, uh, the outreach the online campus, and our foundation class pastor here at Discovery. It's my honor and privilege to be able to be here today and minister God's word to you. Um, pastor Jason and Veronica, man, they are such amazing and powerful just human beings and leaders here at Discovery. So we just want to take a moment and celebrate them. If you can give them a round of applause, amen, amen. So grateful for the leaders that we have at Discovery. But also I want to take a moment, I've, I've had the opportunity in our outreach teams to serve with so many of the individuals here at Discovery. And as much as we love and praise and, and, and appreciate our leaders, one thing I've come to find, man, I love serving with our Discovery teams. Our outreach team, there's nobody like them. Our dream team, man, you guys are such amazing individuals that it makes leading just so beautiful here at Discovery. And I just... Want to take a moment, I found that every service, you guys aren't big fans of giving yourselves a round of applause, so do me a favor, give your neighbor a round of applause for how you guys serve here at Discovery. So much of what we do is not possible without you guys stepping out and stepping in, so we are so grateful for that. Um, so we have been in the sermon, Toxic. How many of you guys have been enjoying Toxic so far? Yes? Yeah. It's been a little rough sometimes, but you know what? Sometimes you got to sand down the edges, you know what I'm saying? So we jumped into Toxic uh, Spirit was our week one, Toxic Soul was our week two, and we've kind of had a detox process for each one, right? So how many of you guys got to enjoy this last week's detox, right? It was finding rest, right, and some naps and snacks, right? I'm a big fan of naps and snacks. That was my wheelhouse, right? Loved that. Um, so we're going to be diving into week three here, which is Toxic Habits. And I just want to take a moment to preface something as we're jumping in. If you miss Toxic Soul and Toxic Spirit... I want you to understand like how key and important it is for you to go back and give those a watch because before we dive into the toxic habits, you have to have an understanding of what's happening internally if you're going to be able to navigate and figure out anything of what's happening externally, right? So you have your soul, you have your spirit, and if your soul and spirit are out of whack, it's absolutely going to, it's going to show up in our external, which is our body, which is our habits, right, our toxic habits. So we have to get our soul and spirit in line if we're going to think we're going to make any kind of change in the habits that we produce, right? And, and Jesus spelled it out so well in Mark, right? So in Mark, what he says is he's, he's talking to Pharisees. If you're not familiar, if you haven't read the Gospels, like 50% of his Jesus arguing with Pharisees, right? So this is a common practice here. But he's explaining to them that there's a difference in how they're perceiving being defiled and what's actually happening. And so Jesus tells them, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. That's a lot to have in there, right? <laughs> there is a lot going on internally with us. And I know as we're going through it, right, that didn't resonate with any of us, right? Where not, none of that list hit us, right? I think the truth is, as we're going through the list, some of them are like, oh, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. Then we hit the one like, oh. We can skip that one. Let's go to the next one, right? Like somewhere on this list is something likely that you are dealing with in your life. It's a toxic habit that you have. And Jesus says, all these vile things, they come from within. And he says, they are what defile you. And when we use that word defile, what it means is like a fancy way of saying it makes you unclean. It makes you dirty. It makes, like it, it takes you and, and moves you into being an unclean individual. And he's saying that's what's happening inside of you. And so that's why we want to make sure that you understand before you're able to change your toxic habits, you have to have a change within, in your soul and in your spirit, okay? So once you've made that shift, many of us have, and I'm sure the question is, well, I made that decision so long ago, but I'm still suffering from so many of my toxic habits, right? Like, I, I'm still struggling with habits that I wanted correction. Well, here's the thing. You may have made that decision but because you've lived at such a long-term imbalance in your soul and in your spirit, what you learned how to do is through your habits create coping mechanisms, right? So when you had that imbalance, when you had that anxiety, when you had that stress, or when you had that frustration, when you had that anger, and the way that you acted it out was some kind of coping mechanism in a habit that you had to make you feel good, to make you feel better, 
And then, yes, you gave your life to Christ, but the problem is the habits didn't come with it, right? You were still going back to a lot of the same coping mechanisms instead of going where you needed to go, right? So you found a way to kind of numb or, in your mind, do away with whatever it is that was stressing you out, but those toxic habits have stuck with you for far too long, okay? And the issue with that is that as you came to experience that shift and change in your soul and in your spirit, you were given like a whole new identity, You became a new person, but your habits didn't come with it. And the issue is, is that those toxic habits, they birth a false identity. See, God has an identity for you, right? He has a new identity for you in his new creation with you. But because of your habits, you're creating your own identity that doesn't line up with the identity that God has for you. What does that mean? That means rather than seeing yourself as a child of God, you see yourself as an addict, That means rather than see yourself as a child of God, you see yourself as an alcoholic, an abuser, a pervert, right? Fill in the blank. There's so many different identifiers that we have that are not identifiers that come from the promises of God. But because of our habits, they're identifiers that we've grabbed hold of, right? And and it's, it's this concept of we are what we repeatedly do. I could stand up here and tell you time and time again that I'm a bodybuilder. But y'all can look at my body and know I'm building something wrong, right? <laughs> You're building it in the wrong spot, my man. So I could say something and say it's my identity, but you guys can look at me and say, I don't think it's lining up with the words that are coming out of your mouth. Some of you guys may understand where I'm going with this. You could say all the things about what you're doing in your life and who you're serving, but if your habits are saying something else, it's going to be hard for people to identify that you're a follower of Christ. So that's what's happening a lot of times we're talking about those identities that we have from within. If you're not lining them up with your habits, you're going to have a hard time. The first thing we have to understand, though, you've got to come to find out who you are before you can change what you do, right? So in, in Scripture, what we find is God sometimes had to so drastically get somebody to understand that there was a change that happened in their life that sometimes he's literally changing their name. Right? We talked earlier about Abraham. Well, that dude's first, like, initial name was Abram, but nobody knows him as Abram anymore. And God had to basically set him apart and say, like, yes, you were once Abram, but now I call you Abraham. And what it stood for was a father of many nations. I mean, that's easy to say when we kind of know the history of it now, but Abraham in the moment, he ain't got no kids. So, like, you could call me a father of many nations, but (laughs) I'm not seeing it, God. Right? So he's not identifying with a name God has for him. God has to literally set him apart and say, like, hey, you got a new name because I've got a new identity for you. We have Simon, who becomes Peter. And it's one of my favorite stories because Simon becomes Peter, and, and Jesus basically tells him, like, when he gives him the new name of Peter, he says, you're the rock on which I'll build my church. And it cracks me up because I can only imagine the other disciples who are witnessing this conversation. And they're like, Peter is the rock <laughs> on which you'll build your church? I know Peter. He's Simon, right? Like, they're not going to necessarily get that there was a name change, but God was showing a new identity. Like, Peter's so far off base, literally, like two sentences after he's being told, like, you're the rock in which I build my church, he's then being told, get behind me, Satan, right? Like, he's so flip-flop, he's not always. So, again, God is trying to get us into a new identity, and if we don't understand who we are, we're going to continue having a problem with what God wants to do within us, okay? Because here's the thing, you've had habits for so long that you've been trying to break, right? Like, if anybody isn't here is perfect and you're not struggling with a habit, can we just have a conversation at the end of this? Because I have got to get to know you, right? We all have our habits, our hangups, our issues, and our frustrations about who we want to be, yet who we continue to become, right? And, and what we have to do is identify those habits in our life that are creating toxicity and transforming us into something that we don't want to be, right? We have to be able to identify what those are. So here's what I'm asking you to do, right? I know it's not fun. I, here's the thing about this sermon. What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to tell your neighbor, like, this is for you, right? Oh, I wish my son would have come today. This is, his, this is a message that's perfect, perfect for him, right? Oh, I wish my da- this would have been perfect for him. No, 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 here's the thing. This is for you, okay? Don't push it off on somebody else. We all have things that we're dealing with. But there's going to be, like, a range on the spectrum of how 
hard those habits are attacking your life. So believe me, there are people in this room right now, I guarantee, that are struggling with a hardcore drug addiction, right? I bet, I have no doubt about it, right? And then there's people in this room that are struggling from a totally different addiction, like hitting the snooze button too many times, right? Like, I get you, the discipline of life, it hits people in different ways. But here's the thing, we all have somebody that we want to be, and we all have somebody that we continue to be. And today we want to make that shift, identify those habits, and say, I want to live this day different from here on out. Amen? So I'm going to give you like the categories in which likelihood is, is that your habit, your toxic habit, it's going to stem from. Okay? So the first one that it's going to stem from is in the form of addiction. That was like a shout out that I was ready for. There we go. In the form of addiction, right? So what does that mean? Again, addiction could come in many different ways, shapes, and forms. If I was to come up here and say, and before you write it off and you say, I'm not an addict, here's the thing. Like when we define what addiction is, it's anything you don't want to do, but you continually do anyway. Right? So before you write it off and say, dude, I'm not an addict. That's for somebody else. No, no. We all have things that we don't want to do that we continually do. If you weren't an addict, then why didn't you just stop now? Why didn't you stop yesterday? Why didn't you stop last month? Right? Like, when I look at my life, look, I've dealt with some serious addictions. I've been able to overcome them. But right now, like, my, my habit, my hang-up that I know what it is, and it may sound cheap, but I'm telling you, the struggle is real. Any late-night snackers in the room? Yeah. Hey, I know it sounds dumb, but I'm telling you, the struggle is real. It's so frustrating. Like, I will go through my whole day, right? I don't want this body, right? I don't want it. I'm fighting to get rid of this. I know it doesn't look like it, but I'm fighting the fight, right? But here's the thing. My breakfast, good. My lunch, fantastic. For dinner, I'm even bragging to my wife about what I already had. And we're talking about let's do some chicken and rice. Let's keep it clean. Let's keep it safe. Amen. We do it. Hey, great. Have a salad. But then it's like I don't even know what time it is sometimes. It's just but suddenly like boom, and I'm like somebody else. I'm like, Is that Skittles? It smells Skittles? Hey, babe, two weeks ago, weren't you eating some chips? I know you didn't finish them. Where'd you leave them? Right? Like, my wife knows. Like, she knows the triggers. It's like a joke. Even Bailey, my daughter, she's 10 years old. She wakes up and sees all the candy wrappers. She's like, Dad, dang, man, take it easy. That's my Halloween candy. Like, no, honey, it was your Halloween candy, right? It's real, but here's the thing. I know it's, it, it's playful, yes, but at the same time, I still go to bed chewing up that regret at the end of the day. It doesn't leave me in a place of good standing when I'm looking at myself and I have, and I line up in my head, I tell myself, ah, I'm undisciplined. Ah, I regret, right? Like, like that shame and frustration. I know it seems cheap, but absolutely, when you're fighting that fight and you're saying, I don't want to do it anymore and you keep going back to it, it's still at the end of the night aiming up, aim, ending up in that same situation where I'm dealing with regret. In Romans, and, and if I could spell this out a little bit, Romans, we can identify a lot with Romans. So Paul wrote Romans, two Romans, and, and basically they had lived their life a certain way, and then they came to know Christ later, right? And so they created habits, they created, they had that imbalance within their soul and their spirit because they lived a certain way their whole life, and then they were introduced to Christ, and they had this change. But the issue is, is they still had all these habits, things that they had been dealing with the whole time. And so Paul's showing up, and he's like, hey, actually, like, we don't do that. Oh, I, I know that was normal for you before, but that's bad for you now. Like, you have to change. You have to just shift in that, right? And so in Romans, he's saying, don't let sin control the way you live. Don't give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Because sin is no longer your master. Paul's trying to get them to understand, right? Like, there are certain sins that will literally hold you down for so long that it will become your master over time. And the truth of it is, is the enemy really has no power over your life. The moment you give your life over to Christ, you stand in victory. All he can get you to do is continue to go back to your same habits and hang-ups and buy into the lie of who he wants you to be rather than who God has created you to be, right? And so in, in this area of, of habits, what we've seen is we, we went on a, a mission trip with Discovery. Um, if you guys aren't familiar, we do take missions every season. We have someone coming up in season two, going to Mexico and Nicaragua. 
That's the best I could roll my R's. I think I did okay, right? But we're taking some missions. And this last season, we went to San Francisco. And if anybody's familiar with San Francisco, like, when it comes to addiction, it's rough. There are a lot of addicts on the streets in San Francisco. We went into an area called the Tenderloin. Anybody familiar with the Tenderloin? No, it's not the pork, right? It's different. It's an area on the streets in San Francisco. And so what it is is it's honestly, like, full of just addicts living on the street right there, homeless. And it's so bad that there's literally, like, it seems like you guys ever go to, like, a vendor fair where there's just vendors set up and you just go to different booths. Like, it's literally like that with drugs on the street. There's just tables set up, and their drugs are just sitting out there, and people are just coming by, grabbing them, buying them, and going back and using it. Like, it's so bad there. But here's the thing. Like, it broke my heart because as you're walking through, you realize, like, each one of these individuals were creations of God with a whole different plan or purpose. Like, this was not what they were created for, yet they found just this to be life, just looking for the next fix. So as we're talking about addiction, I guarantee if you talk to any of them when they were eight years old, nine years old, and you say, who, did, who do you want to be? None of them said, I want to grow up to be addicts and living on the street. None of them. They all had a whole different life ahead of them. We also have Celebrate Recovery, if you're not familiar. That's like our discovery uh, way that we help and support addicts in their areas of struggle, and we have a play for them, and we're helping them recover from their addictions. But in our conversations there, the one thing we find typically is, is this is a conversation I've never had. When I go to somebody and I say, like, hey, you know, how'd you end up here? Oh, I, I planned on being an addict when I was 13, and I nailed it. Right? That, that's not the hope that they had. Instead, what we have is the conversations, and they say time and time again, I never thought it would be me. I never thought I would end up here. I never thought this would be my struggle. I never thought I'd, lo- I'd lose my family. I never thought I'd lose my marriage. But what happens is they give over a little bit and a little bit and a little bit until that addiction overcomes their whole life. So I know you're sitting here today and you may be saying, like, addiction doesn't apply to me. Like, I'm never going to be that guy. Here's the thing. Everybody who's that guy never thought they'd be that guy. It's just one compromise after another. That's why it's so important that we take hold of this concept and say, like, I'm giving the enemy no ground. Anybody ever go fishing before? Right? You got the bait and the hook. You grab hold of that fish. What do you do? You reel it all the way up and you get in the boat, right? And then maybe you tear it up, eat it right then, and, and have a good time. Or maybe you just want to make it late, so you throw it back in the water, right? Teach their own. But here's the thing. We are grabbing hold of that bait and hook when we're grabbing onto the enemy's plans. And he's never the kind of person that's going to reel it up halfway and then just let it chill. Right? Like, oh, okay. So that that habit or that that toxic habit that you have in your life, that addiction that you have in your life, I'm cool with it staying right there and not being so bad. No. He's going to keep pulling and keep pulling and keep pulling until he's got you in his boat right where he wants you and tearing apart and destroying your family, your loved ones, and yourself. Like, that's the end game every time. So if you're giving your life over to a toxic habit, I'm telling you that at the end of the line, that's where it's headed. Right? So, The second area that we have in uh, our toxic habits that are very prominent is with sexual immorality. I know you guys are loving these conversations. I know they just make you feel so comfortable here in church. It's amazing, right? But yes, now we're going to be talking about sexual immorality and what it means and and how these habits are going to be hurting your life. And so we're going to be jumping into Corinthians. It's a very similar concept to what we were talking about earlier with Paul and Romans, where he's writing to the church of Corinth, and the church of Corinth had a whole different way that they would, they would worship their gods, and now they've converted, and they're saying, hey, I just want to worship the one true God. Well, the difficult thing is back in the day when they would worship their gods, they would do it in a way that it's, you know, not great. So they would actually have, like, their temple, and they would worship Aphrodite, and the form of basically having sex was their form of worship to their gods. So you can imagine Paul is stepping in and saying, like, hey, we have a different way that we worship here, you know, when we follow our God. We have a whole different way of life. But he's having to write them and get them to understand, like, there are new ways for which you have to live life. So in Corinthians it says, don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? So should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. For the scriptures say the two are united into one. So here's the thing. I know that many of you may have kind of stopped in that moment and said, like, dude, I'm not 99% of you in here saying, like, I don't 
prostitutes, that's not an issue for me. That's not something I struggle with. If that's like your takeaway from us reading that, here's the thing. God's not upset about the method of payment. Okay, that's, it's not like God's like, oh, you paid for that? That's so bad. The issue is, is the consistent way that you're treating sex as if it's a plaything, right? If you're nonchalant about it and you're just engaging with it whenever you feel like it, I'm telling you what you're doing is you're uniting time and time again with these different individuals and creating these ties after ties and uniting the body of Christ with some random stranger and you think you're just doing a one-night stand walking away and everything's okay, but I'm telling you, you have tied yourself to that and the consequences are going to come down the road later on. It is nothing that you could just dilly-dally around with and play with. What you're dealing with is some serious things. So, yes, I know there's the app of Tinder, and you think you just go ahead and do whatever you want to do, and then you could come back, and you don't have to worry about it. You could do whatever makes you feel good. Whatever makes you feel good. No. There are consequences to all the things, all these toxic habits that you're saying are just things that make you feel good. There are. Right? And so in our area of addiction, when we're talking about the sexual immorality, yes, some of us may be in the form of acting it out. But some of us may be in the form of just viewing it online. So, yeah, I'm talking about pornography, right? So it's honestly an addiction that many people suffer with, while at the same time being something that is truly ruining your soul and spirit as you're continuing to take this in. There are consequences. It's not something that's not, you know, safe or not hurting anybody. It's absolutely hurting and grieving your heart. The, th- the thing about pornography is... According to stats, 9 out of 10 men are watching pornography regularly. 9 out of 10. I saw some of you guys looking around like starting to count, right? 9 out of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh-oh, right? Is that? And women, you're not safe from this either, right? 5 out of 10, basically half women also are engaging in pornography online regularly. This is a, like a pandemic that's taken over the world right now, and especially here in America where we are consuming it and acting like there's nothing to worry about. And the access is so prevalent. Can I tell you, when you're doing it and when you're engaging with it, it is grieving your heart and hurting your soul and spirit while at the same time grieving the heart of God, right? So trust me when I say, like, it is hurting, and it is a habit that's going to be consuming and taking over your life one time, one day at a time as you continue to partake in it. Right? In that third area, I know we're having so much fun in these conversations. I know it's just so easy to grab hold of. That third area that we have our toxic habits in is greed. Right? Greed. So, yes, if you've realized the play here, what I'm saying are the three most difficult habits that we have are sex, drugs, and money. Pretty common, right? Like, I'm not blowing anybody's mind here, but the thing is, is that the devil's been running the same play for so long, and guess what? It's been working. So we have to do something about it. We have to have a shift. We have to have a change in our perspective, right? Somebody brought it up to me this morning, and it's so true. Like, if you don't think that that's the play of the enemy, just listen to some music. Guarantee you it's got something to do with sex, drugs, and money, right? Like, you put on the radio, I was shocked. And this is like eight years ago, so I know it's only gotten worse, but I'll never forget driving with some of my work friends, and they put on this song, and I'm like, y'all have got to be kidding me. This is just on the radio? And they're like, oh, yeah, man, this is, like, not even the worst song. And I'm like, man, my poor daughter. (laughs) Like, I'm so worried about the stuff that's out there for them to just listen to. Like, it's just common and, like, allowed, right? So in this area of greed, what we're talking about here and how the enemy uses it against us is it basically keeps you wound up in that consistent feeling that you need more. Like, I have to have more. Like, you were totally content yesterday with your life and everything was going good, and then your neighbor bought a boat, and suddenly, hey, babe, what do you think about getting a boat? It's like, honey, you ain't been in the water in three years. Why all of a sudden do you want a boat? I don't know. I feel like I need a boat. You've been driving the same car for six years. It's great. It's amazing. AC works. Windows work. Everything's great. But then your best friend, they got a new ride, and all of a sudden, hey, babe, do you know the seats give you a massage now? Come on now. It's like that. that it, and many of us won't say, like, I have a love of money. But the truth is we have a love of comfort. And the way we get more comfort is via more money. Right? And so we fight day after day after day to continue to get that next level of comfort. And we keep telling ourselves time after time that, oh, after my next raise, babe, we'll be good. It's just after. 
Once we get to this point, we'll be good. Once we get to this point, and you continue to add to those levels of comfort, so you say like, hey, I got the raise, now we can afford the car. It's almost within our budget. And then the next time you get the raise and you think you're going to be good, instead, what do you do? You extend that budget just a little bit further and further and further and more and more until you get to the point to where you're not even working to enjoy your things. You're just working to work to continue to have more and more things that you don't even get to use because you're just stuck at work anyway. It's that vicious cycle again and again. And, and here's what Paul says in Timothy when he's talking about the subject of greed. He says, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Like that itself is great wealth. Once you realize contentment with God, it's beautiful. After all, he says, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world. And we can't take anything with us when we leave it. Can I pause there and say, does your life reflect that sentence? Does your life reflect the idea that at the end of this life, I'm not taking anything with me anyway? Or are you fighting, clawing, and scratching for more and more things, not realizing at the end of your life, none of that stuff is going to matter anyway? Right? So he goes on. He says, so if we have enough food and clothing, let's be content with that. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That doesn't sound good. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So what Paul's writing Timothy is basically, be careful in your pursuit of money and finances because at the root of it is all kinds of evil. Am I saying that, that money itself is evil? Most likely no. But to most of us, it sometimes is. That pursuit that we have for it, that need to accumulate more and more of it, that want to have more than that person next to you, that is something you truly need to check your heart about. You do. It's right there in Scripture. This isn't Pastor Sean just making up something on his own. This is Paul warning Timothy that, hey, that pursuit of money, man, there's all kinds of evil in that. You need to be careful in that pursuit. And Paul says, like, contentment should be when you got enough food and enough clothes. Like, look at your laundry list of prayers and how many of them were just for more food and clothes. Right? Let's be real. That laundry list comes with some other things. God, I just want to upgrade that house a little bit. You know what I'm saying? God, I just want to upgrade that car a little bit. Can you hook it up? Right? God, I just want a little bit of that lottery winnings would be cool, right? Like, and we have all these plans of what we could do for it. And God's like, hey, you know what would be great? It's being content with what you have. Whoops. I know. It's a really fun conversation. I'm glad we're having it. Amen? Amen. So uh, as we're going through, those are like the three main toxic habits. Again, it's sex, some form of substance abuse or addiction. And that third thing is with money. And a lot of times, if we're being honest with ourselves, our struggle, our habits that we're so embarrassed about, that we won't talk about, that we keep within and we keep struggling with, are somehow tied in to those three areas there, okay? And what we have to do is create some kind of shift into who it is that God created us to be so that we can have a different pursuit. It comes back to that idea that we have to know who we are to know what it is that God is calling us to do. Whether you realize it or not, God has created you for purpose and calling. Like, it, as you have a heartbeat here, there's a reason God is allowing you to have it. There's a purpose behind it, right? And so as we break free of that, you have to first identify and say, like, I have purpose and meaning. And, and I want us to take a moment and just realize that the world may be saying different things about you because of your habits as to who you are. But I just want to take a moment and point out in Scripture these things that God tells you you are. This isn't like God telling a a profound, amazing disciple. This is like us here. Every one of us can agree and say, like, this applies to us, okay? So these are the basically the names that God has given to us all throughout Scripture, okay? So that first one is he says we are precious in his sight. He says we're not condemned. He says we're forgiven. He says we're loved. He says we're accepted. He says you're a child of God. He says, and this one blows my mind every time I think about it, Jesus says, you are now my friends. Like, that don't make no sense. You're the son of God. I have no right to be your friend, but it's him who says, come to me. I want to be your friend. He says, you're free. You're God's treasured possession. You're complete 
in Christ. You're an ambassador of the Most High, which means like you're part of him and working with him to help us here. You're not part of this world. You're more than a conqueror. You're called, and my personal favorite, he says, you are God's masterpiece. I love that one so much. Like, take a moment to think about that. If you're an artist, what do you like to do with your masterpiece? You love to show it off, right? Like God's saying, like, dude, you are my masterpiece. I love to show you off and what I've done in your life and what you're doing in your life. Like, God considers you his masterpiece, his continual work to completion, right? Like, like it's such a beautiful concept. That's who God sees you as. So those identifiers you have for yourself, you got to start casting them away and say, because of who Jesus says I am, I know I can overcome the situation I'm in. Without knowing the who of who you are, you're never going to be able to overcome these habits and what you're struggling with. So the first thing is that we have to realize, again, like that shift and change as to who God says you are. But the second thing is we have to kind of shift our approach to breaking these habits. So what does that look like? So again, we're going to be jumping into Corinthians. This is Paul writing to him, and he says, all athletes are disciplined in their training, right? All athletes, and, and Corinth had the Olympic Games, so they were all familiar with how athletes would train for an Olympics, right? It says they do it to win a prize that's going to fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. He says, so I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I'm not just playing around. He says, I discipline my body like an athlete. I train it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Does Paul say to Corinthians, like, man, if you want to overcome it, you just got to try a little harder. Try, 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 try again, right? The thing is, we keep coming into our habits thinking if we try this time, we're going to make it. We have to stop trying, and we have to start training. And I, I don't know if you guys understand the shift or the change, and so I'm going to spell it out to you this way. Anybody familiar with the guy Mike Tyson? All right. Yeah, I always wonder, like, how far of the generation I'm from, you know. But I think most of us remember or know who Mike Tyson is. That was like the baddest man on the planet 10 years ago, right? I legit still think right now he's still top five of the baddest men on the planet, right? Like, that dude had a punch that would knock out anybody. So let me tell you this. If I told you today, I'm going to try to box Mike Tyson, how do you feel like I'm going to do? If you're a betting man, is your money on me? Right? Probably not, right? But here's the thing. What if I told you I'm going to be training to fight Mike Tyson. Do my odds at least increase a little bit? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, right? But here's the concept, is if tomorrow I go to training, am I not just one step closer, right? I may fail, absolutely. I step in the ring with Mike Tyson, I could train for 15 years. I'm gonna step in, I might fail, but here's the thing, every day I spend training, I'm one step closer. Every time in sparring, when I get knocked down and I get knocked out, did I fail? No. I learned. I adapted. I'm training to overcome and move forward every single day, one step closer to the victory that I'm pursuing. Training is the shift because here's the thing. If I'm trying and I get knocked out, I failed. And we walk away like, well, I did my best. It failed. It ended. Like some of us are living our lives like it's that free seven-day trial, right? How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Free seven-day trial, give us our credit card, we're going to charge you in 30 days. You're living that out in your discipline and in your life where up front you're paying nothing for it, and in 30 days you're paying with the regret and shame of it, right? Like that's the truth of it. We have to be willing to pay up front in our discipline and in our habits so that we can continue to train so we can overcome what it is these habits are bringing to us in the future. So what does that look like? Hebrews 12:11. It says it this way. This is the author of Hebrews. He says, no discipline is enjoyable. How many of y'all would agree with that? No discipline is enjoyable, right? Like, that's the truth of it. If, in, if discipline was enjoyable, we'd all have it. It's not enjoyable. It's not fun. It says, while it's happening, it's painful. But afterward, there'll be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in the right way. The truth is, as we train, we need to add to our life an abundance of discipline to make it through in these habits that continually lead to hit us up. If we don't have discipline as a part of our life, we're never going to be able to overcome what it is that we're facing. So what does discipline look like? 
See, discipline is choosing what you want most over what you want now. So what do you want most? I look at my life and what do I want to be known as? Man, at the end of my life, I want to be known as a good father, a better father, a better husband, a good husband to my wife, right? Better brother. I want to be a better friend to those around me. All those things are things that I want most. That's what I want to be about. But here's the thing. If I just jump into it at the end of my life, we all know that without the daily disciplines of feeding into those different roles in my life, if I don't do that at the end of my life, I'm not that, right? So what does it mean? It means when I come home from work, rather than shutting my kid in the, in the bedroom and tell him be quiet so I can have a nap, it means instead maybe I got to spend some time with her, right? Invest into her. Because here's the thing. If I invest into her life now, when she's facing those struggles when she's 15, I've paid my dues, and now she's going to come to me, right? She's going to trust that I'm going to be there for her. But here's the thing. If I'm not paying that price now, where is she going to go? To whoever has been. And it may not be where you want her to go, right? If you're not paying your dues as a husband, if you're not paying your dues as a wife, if you're not doing what it is that you have to do in the disciplines of your every day, you're going to continue to see that drift continue. Because you're not paying in the habits of discipline in your life. So at the, end of it, at the end of the road in three to six months and you continue to drift and, and you're lacking that discipline, you're going to find that you're so far off base from what you ever wanted to be. And that's where so many of us are living right now. Because we're not willing to pay the price now and instead we're living with regret. So here's the question I have for you. Will you choose the pain of discipline or are you going to continue to choose the pain of regret? How many of us are fed up with looking back over the last six months, looking back over the last year, two years, three years, and sitting there in regret as to who you wish you could have been and who you are now? Every single time I do this, I always think to myself, if I would have just, if I had just done this, imagine where I'd be now. But then what do I do? I cast it aside. I don't change anything. And I ask myself the same question in three years. I'm tired of the same old cycle, and I hope you guys are too. These toxic habits that I have in my everyday, I have to substitute them with the good habits in the pursuit of the goal that I have in Christ. I have to because I'm so tired of ending up in the same exact situation I'm in. Amen. Anybody with me on that? I'm tired of being the same old me. I want to be who God created me to be. Amen. Amen. I want to be closer to the masterpiece because right now I'm not feeling like a masterpiece. You know what I'm saying? So, hey, what do we need to do? We have, like, that detox process that we've been adding to each component of our toxic series, right? And so every one of them has, like, a play at the end of it that we're going to start detoxing in a certain way. And so in habits, we have three things we're going to ask you to start implementing in your life to help you detox. And instead of doing the habits you typically do, substitute them with these habits, okay? And so that first one that we're going to start doing is we're going to start the day with submission to God. We have to start our day with submission to God. We actually um, push this in our Celebrate Recovery uh, meetings that we have. Because here's the thing, and, it, and it's what we've come to know whether you realize it or not. You know your life and how you live it, what comes of it, right? Like when I live a day that's, that's run by Sean, at the end of the day, usually I'm frustrated by what Sean did, right? Like I know what Sean produces, but here's what I have yet to find the limit of. My day that I submit to God and I allow him to do with it whatever he will. I have yet to hit a moment or a day in my life where God's like, hey, Sean, you hit my capacity. Like, that's all I could do. Not like, like, I'm now limited. You're at the best point of your life. No, every time when we give ourselves over to God and that submission to God and you let him do with it what he can, you see that multiplication effect in your life time and time again. You will not find that you've hit a limit to what God can do with what you offer him. If you give him five loaves and two fish, just watch him feed the 5,000. When you offer him, like, this is just me, the screwed up individual that I've known every single day, and you offer it to him, watch him feed the 5,000. Amen? There wasn't nothing special about the loaves and the fish, but there's something special about you. So imagine what he could do when you hand yourself over to him every single day, right? The way it says in Scripture... Romans 8, 5, it says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, basically those who live in it every single day, what they're going to do is think about sinful things, right? As you spend every single day in your same old routines, you're going to continue to think about and dabble into the same sinful things you've been doing. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, 
they think about things that please the Spirit. Like, that's where I want to be. And if you start your day with that kind of environment and atmosphere, you're going to set yourself up for success. We talked about Romans 6, 12 through 14 earlier. We're going to expound on what it is that Paul had to say to the Romans here. And, and this is what we want. Like, this is the play here, okay? It says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give into sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. And here's the instead. Here's what Paul is saying. This is what you have to start doing. Give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what it is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. He says, you got a new address. Here's your new address. You live under the freedom of God's grace. Like, that's where I want to spend my every single day. And the way you do that is by starting your day and saying, God, I submit to you and whatever you have for me. I don't want to live by my means any longer because I know what I have in store for me. And it's not anything I want to do anymore. I want to start living for him. So here's that second step that we all have to start walking in. We're going to add this to our day. We have to remove the temptation or the access. Okay? Remove the temptation or access. So sometimes in like that recovery play, another thing that we do, if somebody is trying to come off of an addiction like drugs or alcohol or something, sometimes what you have to do is remove them from their environment. Right? Because once you remove the access they have to their dealers or to the situation or to the community and you kind of shift and change that, now that access is more difficult and it's just like an extra barrier to them before they fall into the same thing. Right? So in our lives, what we could do, like let's talk about that with the concept of pornography. Right? Here's what Corinth, in, in Corinthians what it says you should do when it comes to pornography and sexual sin. Very simple. It says run. <laughs> Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Run from sexual immorality. So what does that look like in the form of like pornography? What can you do to eliminate it? Because we've all learned that the access is so easy. It's on your cell phone right there in your pocket. It's everywhere around you. So here's what you could do. There's an app called Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes, if you haven't heard of it, it's one of the coolest concepts. What it does is it actually like stores itself on your phone. And everywhere you go in your browser, it sends screenshots and sends it to your accountability partner. So like my wife is my accountability partner. If I go searching for things, my wife is getting bombarded by messages like, oh, hold up, right? Like, not okay, right? So it literally, like, is your own personal cell phone snitch, right? It's amazing. And so some of you guys are saying, like, Sean, you have it on your phone now? Like, oh, are you, you still struggle with that? Like, no, 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 here's the thing. Why would, I, why would I wait until I do struggle with it when there's a play I can run now to prevent it from ever happening? Like, why wait until I'm in the struggle to then figure out how to get out of it? Why not just prevent it from happening in the first place? So if you're saying, like, oh, I don't struggle with that. I don't have to worry about that. Like, okay, you can still do it. Like, it's still something that's great. It's another asset you can have, another tool that you can have in your toolkit to prevent from the enemy from ever having a stronghold on your life, right? So Covenant Eyes is a great play, but in the end, find yourself an accountability partner to help you in these situations, right? And, and, and do your best to flee from all those sexual temptations. And the other thing in Matthew and that concept of what it's doing to you, when you're watching that pornography, it says your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. It's again that idea like it's not one of those things that's not hurting anybody. It's crushing and killing your soul. Right? So again, Run that play, add that to your life. If you're looking at your habits and you're identifying it, look and say like, okay, I need to remove the access from this. I need to remove the temptation from this. Our late night snackers, what do we got to do? We got to throw away all those treats and just get them out of the house so we can't go hunting anymore at 10 p.m. Or maybe just go to bed. Come on. I know y'all know I'm preaching to myself, but it's the truth, man. Just go to bed, get some sleep, okay? Remove the temptation or the access. The third thing that we have to start doing is intentionally do something that doesn't benefit you. I want us this week, every day, to perform one type of action, do something for someone that has no way that it can benefit you. 
This is how Jesus spells it out in Luke, okay? He says, he turned to his host, and he says, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, and your rich neighbors. He says, because they're going to invite you back, and that's going to be your reward. Like, when you do lunch, like, it's okay. Have your friends, invite your neighbors. Like, okay, like, do lunch, but no, like, they're probably, when they, we all have been there where they're like, hey, I'll get you next time, right? Like, like that's your reward for that. I want us to spend a week with the potential for a different reward. He says, instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. He says, then at the resurrection of the righteous, God re will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Man, I want to be living my life in pursuit of the rewards that God has for me and no longer looking for the rewards that make me feel good just in that moment. Like, I want to see the extent of what God's rewards can be because I guarantee you I have not seen the end of it. There's no point in which God is maxed out and, again, says, like, I gave you all everything I had. Like, no, absolutely not. I want to live daily, and here's the important part of it. It's going to move you every single day one step further from a selfish living because that's where a lot of times where we find ourselves is living every single day for ourselves. And so as we do these actions once a week, and we say, or every single day this week, and we just take one step closer to being unselfish. Because here's the thing. If we're saying we're in pursuit of Christ and we want to be more like him, there is nobody that we've seen on the face of the earth that was more unselfish than Jesus Christ. Literally giving himself up as a sacrifice for us. So as we just continue to take one step closer, as you go through this detox process and you're saying, every day I'm going to find one way that I'm going to do for somebody something that they cannot repay me for, I guarantee you you're going to find yourself further from selfishness and closer to Christ. Amen. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.